Welcome everyone to Astronomy on Tap. Sorry for the slight delays. Uh, this is our first virtual Astronomy on Tap that we're doing through Los Angeles's Astronomy on Tap chapter. And welcome. So normally these events are done at Der Wolfskopf, a bar in Old Town Pasadena once a month, but obviously that's been uh, postponed because of the pandemic. I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Caltech in the astronomy and astrophysics department, and I run these events. But we have contributors usually from Caltech, Carnegie Observatories, JPL, UCLA, Planetary Society, all sorts of institutions around Pasadena and Los Angeles. Uh, tonight, we're going to see how it goes. Uh, we've got a couple of talks by two researchers at Caltech, one on exoplanets and one on star formation. We have a pub trivia that we're going to do, which should be fun. And of course, we have beer. I hope you guys are, are enjoying. This is not a Chimay. This is a, a triple Carmelite. Just keeping with the European theme of our beer bar, but I hope you're enjoying a beverage as well. So tonight we are focusing on the Hubble Space Telescope because it is the 30th anniversary of the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope into orbit. It was done on April 24th, 1990, and it's been up there doing cutting edge breakthrough science for the last 30 years, and hopefully we'll continue doing so for a bit longer, at least until we have the James Webb Space Telescope up there. And so our talks are celebrating the Hubble Space Telescope and the contribution that contributions that it's made in various different forms in different fields of astrophysics. So our speakers for tonight, if you guys want to come back in here. Ah, Dr. Jessica Spake, Hello. Dr. Matt Orr, welcome guys. Thanks. Let's see. Messed up. I always struggle to get everything working the way it's supposed to, but I think it's okay. Let's see. Yeah. Okay, great. So, quick introduction for these two fine scientists. Dr. Jessica Spake is from Southampton in the UK. She did her undergrad at Imperial College London, then worked as a waitress and lived with her mom for a bit. If anything motivates her in her work, uh, it is not going back to being a waitress because she spills everything on her customers. She did her PhD in, at University of Exeter before taking the 51 Pegasi B postdoctoral fellowship at Caltech. That's awesome. You're a waitress. A really bad waitress. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I worked in a fast food joint for about three weeks called Burgerville in the Pacific Northwest. And it was enough motivation to not want to do that for the rest of my life. Um, I once built an entire five kilo box of grated cheese over a freshly made deli bar right at lunch where there was a queue of people queuing up to buy the sandwiches that I just covered in grated in five kilos of grated cheese. It was awful. <laughs> so clumsy. Did, um, were you dismissed because of that or everyone was like... Surprisingly, oh. no. And that wasn't the last time I spilt stuff. <laughs> okay, sweet. Were all the sandwiches cheese sandwiches at least? Sadly, no. It was a bad mix as well. There was like prawn and tuna and like stuff that doesn't go with cheese. The chef was so mad. <laughs> the customers were mad. Everyone was mad. It was, it was not good. Um, our second speaker for the evening is Dr. Matt Orr, who is a lifelong Angelino hailing from Leafy La Cañada. Never having left the LA basin, he attended both USC and Caltech. And despite all this, he is a card carrying LA Metro rider and avid outdoorsman. When he's not doing theoretical astrophysics or trapped inside for the foreseeable future, he enjoys hiking, biking, softball, and the occasional white Russian. Nice. Oh, is that what you're drinking? Oh, wow. Stay on brand. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. What, what, are, what are you drinking, Jessica? Um, $4 wine mm. and homemade quarantini. <laughs> What's in a quarantini? 
You don't want to know. I'll tell you later. Okay. Just everything, all that's left. <laughs> um, okay, so let's start it off with Jessica's talk, and then um, and then we'll we'll chat a bit in between the two. Take some questions for those of you watching the um, watching this at home. I encourage you to during excuse me, Jessica's talk to write in the comment section of YouTube various questions that you might have about about her the the content of her talk or the science or Hubble or whatever, and we'll try and address them during the Q and A. And then uh, we'll have Matt's talk, and then the astronomy themed pub trivia will be at the very end. And there's unfortunately there aren't any prizes because I don't know how we would do prizes. And plus, normally at our pub trivia, we, we, we make it so people can't, well, we try to make it so people can't cheat by looking things up on Google by having a strict, if you see something, say something policy where people are self-policing. But now, I mean, what are we going to do? Like you've got Google literally at your fingertips. There's no way I can, I can police that. So honor, honor system, honor system. Yeah. But how am I going to deliver prizes? I'm not wearing my mask. So uh, yeah, we'll just go through the questions and, and you can shout out the answers over the, the YouTube and it'll be fun. So, okay. Jessica, would you like to share your screen and we'll have it away? Love to. All right, Matt, time for us to go incognito. Do you see this? Yes, this looks great. All right. Well, um, should I start? Yes, I guess. I'll take that as a yes. Thanks so much um, for coming everyone. Hello. Uh, today I'm gonna to be talking to you about observing the alien skies of exoplanet atmospheres um, through the all-seeing eye of the Hubble Space Telescope. So an exoplanet is a planet around another star. And this here is the very first full view image of our planet Earth taken by an astronaut on their way to the moon in 1972. So we would not be here to appreciate the beauty of this image if it weren't for having the right kind of atmosphere on our planet. And there's so much more to learn from planets, from the atmospheres of planets around other stars as well. For example, um, this is an image showing all of the planets in our solar system in order of size to scale. And you can see on the left, we have quite small rocky planets, and then there's quite a big gap, and then the larger, planets that are dominated by lighter materials like hydrogen, helium, ices of ammonia, water, and methane. This is what our solar system looks like. However, of the thousands of exoplanets that we found to date, the most common size of exoplanet is somewhere between Earth and Neptune. So we do not have any planets of this type in our solar system. Is our solar system weird? why don't we have one of these mid-sized planets? Um, right now, we're actually unable to, to know whether most of these planets are mostly made of sort of rocky material with a very lightweight hydrogen helium envelope, or are they made up of more um, ices, more like mid-weight mid uh, molecules like water and methane. Right now, it's a bit of a mystery what these most common exoplanets are made of. And by studying what's in the atmosphere of these planets, we can start to understand what the bulk of these planets are made of and answer this very important question we have in, in exoplanet science. So I study the atmospheres of exoplanets using the Hubble Space Telescope, which has a very long, proud history of being the first to discover things in exoplanet atmospheres specifically. For example, Hubble was used to detect the first ever exoplanet atmosphere in 2002. Uh, it found sodium, gaseous sodium, in the atmosphere of HD 
by B, <laughs> which is a hot Jupiter exoplanet, which means that it is a very hot, gassy, massive planet that orbits very close to its host star, and it orbits its star once every 3.5 days. Um, these kinds of planets, because they're so massive and close in, they are typically the easiest kinds of planets to discover uh, and the easiest kinds to look into their atmospheres. Hubble also made the very first detection of hydrogen, the most common element in the universe around in an exoplanet atmosphere. And the hydrogen was being stripped away from the star, um, stripped away from the planet, sorry, in great quantities. And so it looked like that planet was losing a lot of its atmosphere to space. Another Hubble um, series of detections. Um, so Hubble has detected water in the atmosphere of more than 10 exoplanets so far, including last year, water in the atmosphere of one of those mid-sized planets between the size of Earth and Neptune that I was talking about a bit before. So Hubble has been extremely useful for studying exoplanet atmospheres. Oh, there's, that's the water in the planet atmosphere. Um, in particular, the instrument on board Hubble that I use is called the Whitefield Camera 3. Now this is housed at the back of the telescope, which you can see on the left, bottom left-hand side of this diagram, along with many other instruments, for example, STIS, the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph, and that was used to find sodium in an exoplanet atmosphere. Um, and then you can see the light comes into the telescope on the top uh, left-hand side uh, of this diagram here, where that little flap is up there. So the Whitefield Camera 3 instrument is one of the most versatile and sensitive astronomical instruments that we have. It's very useful and it's been, you can use it in two main modes, um, one of which is just a straight up camera mode, which is used for taking very detailed pictures of the night sky. And Whitefield Camera 3 was actually used to take one of the most famous images in all of astronomy, which is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, which I'm showing you now. So the diameter of this image is one tenth of the diameter of the full moon. So it covers a tiny patch of sky, but in here there are over 10,000 galaxies. So this is a demonstration of the, just the sheer number of galaxies in, in, the, in the entire galaxy. And I, I love this image because you can see the variety of galaxies. Um, possible in here. It's a really beautiful image and I'm really pleased that I'm able to use this instrument to do something totally different. Um, so I use the uh, Wi-Fi camera 3 in its other mode, its spectroscopic mode, um, which means that the light coming in from the telescope, in that beam of light we put in um, uh, a piece of optics which splits up the light into its different wavelengths or different colours. Um, like a triangle prism experiment that you might have done at school. Um, this is very useful for studying exoplanet atmospheres and you might be wondering exactly how that's done. Um, so the technique I use to study exoplanet atmospheres is called transmission spectroscopy. And to do this, we take a planet that passes in front of its star once every orbit. And we look at how much light that planet blocks out at different wavelengths. So, for example, if there is a lot of um, sodium in the planet's atmosphere, um, the planet will block out a lot of light at 598 nanometers because sodium gas absorbs very strongly at that wavelength. So what we do is we take the light through the telescope, we split it up um, into its different wavelengths, and then at each wavelength, we measure the brightness over time and we get these light curves, which you can see in the top right hand corner. And then it's the size of those, the dips that we can see that's what we're interested in measuring. And then we, we can make what's called a transmission spectrum, which is a plot of the wavelength on the x-axis and the size of that transit depth on the y-axis. And you can see in this plot here, there's a very strong absorption line um, in yellow optical light, five, eight, nine nanometers where sodium absorbs strongly. So that's how we can find things in exoplanet atmospheres. So I used the Wi-Fi camera three on Hubble Space Telescope and pointed it at a really interesting system. Um, so the exoplanet is called WASP-107b and it's one of the lowest density uh, exoplanets that we've found in the whole universe. Um, 
it's about the same size as Jupiter, as you can see from the scale diagram, but it only has 12% of Jupiter's mass. It also orbits a small orange, fairly cool star, which makes WASP 107 to be actually one of the lowest temperature planets that we're able to study right now. Um, and it has a temperature of around 500 degrees uh, Celsius. It's still pretty hot. So WASP-107b has been observed before with Whitefield Camera 3 in a different mode, um, a study led by Laura Kreiberg in 2018. They found water in WASP-107b's atmosphere. So this is a transmission spectrum plot that I just explained. And we have wavelength on the bottom, transit depth on the y-axis. And the bump in the middle is caused by um, an absorption feature of water. And you can also see generally a flat bottom to uh, this plot, and that's caused by clouds it, high up in the exoplanet atmosphere, which block light equally at all wavelengths, making this flat bottom um, of this transmission spectrum. Here is an updated plot with our observations added on the left of this plot in blue. Now, I don't know if you can see, there is a very strong looking absorption feature that I've highlighted in dark blue at around 10, 8, 30 angstroms. We were a bit confused when we saw this very strong signal in our data because this, had this had kind of feature had never been seen before. No strong absorption line around that wavelength had ever been seen in exoplanet atmosphere. And it took us months of ruling out all of the possibilities um, what could cause this absorption feature um, until we finally um, realized that the most likely cause of this absorption feature is helium absorption in the exoplanet atmosphere. Now, 10 uh, helium is the second most abundant element in the entire universe. And 10% of our gas giant planets, Jupiter and Saturn, is helium. And so we expect gas giant exoplanets like WASP-107b to also be made up of 10% helium. And also this, this specific line that we detected at 10, 30 angstroms was predicted in the year 2000 to be a very strong and important line in exoplanet atmospheres. But it took 18 years um, for people to detect it because it's in quite, for a few reasons, um, it's in quite a difficult wavelength space um, for detectors at that time. Uh, to look at. And um, people didn't typically look um, at exoplanet atmospheres at that specific wavelength. And the size of our absorption signal was so strong that it told us that the helium in WASP-107b's atmosphere extends over 30,000 kilometers above the lower atmosphere where those clouds are in WASP-107b's atmosphere that I told you about. Now, there's probably also hydrogen and other things extending up that far as well. It's just that we haven't detected those yet. And this is what we, an artist's impression, um, this is what you might imagine um, the helium surrounding the exoplanet to look like in, in gray there. You might wonder why um, this discovery might be useful. Um, so because this helium stretches out over such a large distance, um, we can see it stretched out a large distance above the lower atmosphere, it's very useful for studying these upper regions of exoplanet atmospheres, which until then had been really quite difficult to study because there's such a low density. So you need very abundant species like hydrogen or helium with a very strong absorption line to even be able to, to see these upper reaches of exoplanet atmospheres. And these parts, these upper parts of the atmospheres are very important for the long-term evolution of planets because this is where atmospheric escape happens. Now, many exoplanets and planets in our solar system experience atmospheric escape. And it's important to understand that if we want to know how long a planet might hold on to an atmosphere for, or whether all of the atmosphere escapes um, as one, or whether different molecules escape at different rates of the atmosphere. This image I'm showing you is from the Dynamic, Dynamics Explorer 1, which is an Earth satellite um, that was launched in the early 80s and it observes the, looks back at the Earth in, at UV wavelengths. And you can see here this glowing um, aurora around the whole, um, this halo around the Earth in red, which is uh, hydrogen slowly escaping from the top of Earth's atmosphere. So the Earth is still going through atmospheric escape. 
and also you can see um, a glowing ring of the aurora borealis which i like um in the, at the north pole and also some at the tropics some bands of glowing excited oxygen um which is cool and this is taken from 7,000 kilometers above the, the earth's atmosphere so our results are useful for studying atmospheric escape um one of the most exciting things i think about science is sharing um, the joy of the discovery with other people, sometimes just totally by accident. Um, so while we were writing up the paper um, for this helium result, we happened to be visiting um, the Centre for Astrophysics um, at Harvard, and we randomly bumped into uh, a postdoc there called Antonia Oklopcic, and she was, is a theorist, and she was almost finished her model of helium absorption via the 10830 action line in exoplanet atmospheres. So the exact thing that we had found in our observational data, and this plot here is a figure from her um, paper. It's kind of like an upside down transmission spectrum wavelength uh, along the bottom and sort of an upside down transit depth on the Y axis. And this is the helium line at 10830 angstroms, which actually has this double peaked um, shape, which you can see here. And I cannot describe to you the excitement I felt bumping into somebody where she was predicting, this is something that we should be seeing and looking for in exoplanet atmospheres. And we had the data and we, we, we see this thing. Um, I will remember that moment forever. It was really uh, joyous. Um, and also since then, um, many telescopes from the, well, a few telescopes from the ground have been pointed at exoplanets specifically in this line and have detected it at much higher resolution than we we're able to do with the Hubble Space Telescope. For example, the Carmenes Telescope in Spain um, with a much higher resolution has already seen at least helium in at least four different exoplanets. Um, and you can see instead of being a single data point, the line is that double peak line of the, the double peak shape of the line is actually resolved in this data. And there's so much more information you can get at high resolution. Um, you can see how fast the winds of the helium are being stripped away from the planet. I really hope that much there's much more to learn using this line and looking at more and more exoplanets. Um, and it's great to see that a, a first discovery made using the Hubble Space Telescope has, has launched um, some new, new detections and possibly new discoveries and um, with other telescopes too. Um, thanks so much for listening. Uh, I'd just like to end by turning back to the Hubble Ultra Deep Field and taking a look once again, just because I think that taking a step back and immersing yourself in the scale and the wonder of the universe and reminding ourselves of our place in it can be some small antidote to the anxiety that we're all feeling right now. Not only that, but sharing the joy of the discovery and the beauty with other people is a great way to connect um, with other tiny pieces of the universe. And so I'm really pleased that you have all joined in and, and connected with me today. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Excellent. Thank you, Jessica. That was that was wonderful. Okay, let's see. I'm gonna stop your screen share here. Um, come back on video wise though. You're you're hidden away. Oh, and I'm revealing my green screen. Oh no. Oh no. Oh, no. The secret's out. I'm not actually floating through space. No oh, problem. There I am. Oh, I'm floating through space. Um, that was awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Let's see. There were a few questions that people had oh, during great. the presentation that I will. Great. Sorry, uh, I didn't. I like this one. Yeah. If Hubble were orbiting Pegasus 51b, could it have detected Earth on Earth's atmosphere? Um, I don't know. Oh, am I allowed to Google? I don't know. I can't remember how, how far away. Oh, no, I don't think so. Um, because the relative sizes are so different. 51 Pegasi B is so much larger um, than the Earth. The Earth has a very tiny, tiny, thin atmosphere. And 
even if they had a Hubble Space Telescope, it's not sensitive enough at that distance to to see an Earth the atmosphere of an Earth-sized planet. I don't think so, sadly. Okay. Okay. Um, someone asked, "Do you have to correct for the redshift in taking these in the spectra that you've been discussing and analyzing?" So, typically, exoplanets, the ones we can discover, are sort of within um, 400 light years. And stars that close, the redshift is um, not that high. Uh, so, no, if you're talking about the redshift between, um, yeah, between the star and the planet, just as the system as a whole, then no. Um, because all these plants are so close, the redshift is really tiny. Right, that's right. Um, there's a great question. How competitive is it to get observational time on Hubble? And what's the proposal planning and coordination process like? <laughs> oh, it's really hard. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very competitive. I think it, it, it depends, but it's between um one in four and one your chances are between one in four and one in five. Oh um, really oh for the yeah. hst time that we've applied for so i do stuff with galactic scale and i always thought it was like an oversubscription rate of like 10. oh okay i don't no, know well, but it, yeah. it varies it varies depending <laughs> on what you're doing one in five, yeah. observations or, or or theory or or like archival stuff but it's one in five keen. I might, I might, I might have got that wrong. I think it's very, I find it very hard. Yes. I'm, yeah, it's, and also the time, I think one of the, it's, it's, it's kind of, I think self-selecting as well, because, and that when you apply, specifically when you apply for Hubble, every single, like all of your exposures have to be justified. You basically have to have an entire plan, very detailed plan for all of your observations. It's, it takes, a lot of it takes so much time it should take like a month probably to write a good decent proposal and so if you don't have a great idea then people often just don't yeah don't submit so i think it's also self-selecting selective yeah 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 that makes sense um someone asks why did a theorist have to model the existence existence of helium in the exoplanet atmospheres didn't the examples of saturn and jupiter and some of the other gas giants in our solar system kind of make it a given that you'd have helium in those atmospheres. Sure. One thing I didn't have time to talk about, which I would love to, would have loved to in the talk, so I'm glad you asked, thank you, is that um, it's not just regular ground state helium we're talking about. Um, so regular sort of ground state helium, helium's, helium has two electrons, and when they're both in their ground state, this is very stable atom, and it doesn't have very many absorption lines, which is part of the reason why it's taking so long to find it. So this specific line that we're talking about only forms in this special excited state of helium. Now, for that to happen, what you have to do is you have to excite the helium atom, knock out one of its electrons, and then another electron has to rejoin and cascade down, and it gets stuck in this excited, uh, we call it metastable state, because it stays there relatively for a long time. And it's in this state that one of these electrons absorbs that 10830 angstrom line, specific line that I was talking about. Um, yeah, so that's it, so that requires more detailed modeling um, because to add in the star which excites the helium, yeah, that, that adds, some, adds in some extra, well, lots of extra uh, modeling to that. Okay. Um, there was a question during the talk about Hubble in general, that it had suffered from some optical problems initially. And so, yeah, I, I just thought it'd be worthwhile to, to point out a little bit of the history of Hubble. So, and, and just, I meant, so I meant to put together a, a, a slideshow initially to kind of get everybody up to speed. So everyone was on the same page with respect to Hubble, but I ran out of time. So we can just discuss it now, though. And that yeah. is, so Hubble Space Telescope is one of the great, NASA's great observatories. So these were launched over the last uh, 20, 25, even longer, 30 years. 
well, I guess Hubble was 30 years ago, so, but it was even longer. So there was one great observatory for each kind of band of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, Hubble was over the visible wavelengths of light. Spitzer, which was just retired, was over the infrared. Chandra was over the X-ray. Compton was over the gamma ray. And what else am I forgetting? Is it just four? Is there another one? I don't know. I think it's just those four. Four sounds right. Four sounds right. Four sounds right. <laughs> um, and yeah, Hubble and Chandra are the, are the last two that are remaining. Hubble is a 2.4 meter uh, primary mirror, so about eight feet across. And when it was launched in 1990, it was, it, it, there are a lot of benefits to going to a space-based telescope because you aren't underneath the atmosphere. So you don't have, you don't suffer all of the problems with atmospheric perturbations, kind of blurring out your images. And it was really, really a benefit. But part of what was lost in that process was that the initial design messed up the primary mirror. So there was something called spherical aberration. And I have a, a little image that describe that, that kind of shows what that looks like. And I'm just gonna show it super fast. Share my screen. Where the heck is my? Oh, here it is. Okay. Okay. Can you can you see that, Jessica? Maybe they can if you can. Okay. So, um, spherical aberration is essentially when your lenses or uh, or the the optics that you use, the top is is a is a, a perfect optical system that takes light from your object, your target on the left side, and each of those red lines is a, a separate light ray coming from that distant oh, object. I'm not seeing that. I'm just seeing a before and after picture, sorry. Yeah, Cameron, I'm just seeing the two oh. photos. Oh, is it true? Oh, okay. Maybe I'm not, okay, I messed, I seem to have messed it up then. Well, yeah, that makes now. No, yeah, yeah. yeah, there you go. Okay, well, I'll just show this. I'll just show this. Uh, so on the top is a good optical system. The bottom is a messed up optical system. On the left side, each red line represents a, a light ray coming from a distant astronomical object on the left. And they go through a lens which bends and warps those light rays and focuses them. And on the top, they're focusing to a point. So at that point, that's the, the, the focal plane of that optical instrument, like a magnifying glass, for instance, is a simple optical situation. But you can imagine this with a more complicated system like a telescope, and you want that to all go to a single point, and that's the point where you are effectively bringing things to a focus. But if your lens or your mirror is not honed perfectly, then you can get a variety of different optical problems, but one of them is spherical aberration, which is what the bottom system has. So things come to focus at a different point and you end up with essentially your, your endpoint image being out of focus. And what that looks like is demonstrated here for a, a galactic system before, so they, they initially launched it and then they took a bunch of pictures and they were like, oh shoot, we totally mucked this up. <laughs> this is all out of focus. It's all blurry. It looks like crap. So there was a servicing mission that went up. It was launched. So Hubble went into space in 1990. They, it was, excuse me, it was put in an orbit in near earth orbit. So it was actually possible to go up and service the telescope while it was in orbit. It wasn't so distant that we, it was just like gone and we couldn't, we could never get there. And so brave astronauts amongst the, uh, the NASA astronaut corps went up with shuttles and were actually able to, to, to pour, uh, dock with the, the Hubble Space Telescope and change certain aspects of it. So in this case, they, they put in a corrector instrument that essentially corrected for the spherical aberration. And then they took some more images and voila, you actually had things coming into focus at a much high, higher resolution and higher, higher optical quality. So. Yes, initially there were problems, 
And basically the data taken between 1990 and 1993 suffered from these problems. But since then, it's been, uh, Hubble's been serviced several times. Initially, the main thing was trying to address the optics, but in each servicing mission, not only did the astronauts add additional instruments like additional cameras and spectrographs and whatnot, like uh, the wild field, wide field camera that Jessica was talking about. But they also were able to change out some of the instruments internal to, oh, I can stop sharing. I don't have to share my crap anymore. Um, Matt, come on in. You, you can join in this conversation. And they, in adding these, they added things like, uh, what were the, what are the, the, cyl the cylindrical things that rotate around and allow the thing to point. Nice. What's that? Reaction okay. wheels. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I did. Um, because, you know, we think about Hubble sitting up in space and it's like pointing over there and, but we want it to point over there to point at that target. Well, it doesn't just spit out some propulsion over here and, and push it over to that side. That would be super wasteful. So it has reaction wheels that rotate around and it spins because of conservation of angular momentum, which is great. And it rotates around, but over the course of being used a hundred percent of the time for years, those things break down. And so astronauts would go up and replace these things periodically. I mean, that's what did in the Kepler mission. When their reaction wheels finally all failed, uh, that mission that was also an exo, that was specifically an exoplanet hunter, uh, finally broke down. Although they were downright heroic trying to get it to keep working, even though it could only move sort of one way. Oh, with K2. Yeah, the K2 mission. That's right. And it's way too far away to, to service. That one. That's yeah. right. Where where does um where does Kepler sit in its in its orbit or did it? It's in some sort of trash orbit. I think it's Earth trailing, if I'm correct. A trash orbit? Well, it's dead now. Well, <laughs> it's dead now. That doesn't mean it's in a trash orbit. It's in a technical. Term. Well, if it's trash and it's in orbit, it's in a trash orbit. <laughs> that's, I think that's how. Um, have, you, have you seen um? images of those servicing missions because I it was right at the end of my PhD before I even actually I actually saw pictures of astronauts ser servicing Hubble and it it's amazing it's yeah. I don't know it's super inspiring to just send humans up there to space to fix a telescope fix and also it. when you look at it an Im the image of it by itself it doesn't do it it doesn't put it you can't put it to scale and then when you see actual people uh, next to it. You think 2.4, okay, in. that's not a very big mirror, but then you put someone next to it and you're like, oh, that's a really big telescope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's super, it super is. Um, okay, uh, let me see. I didn't, I haven't been monitoring the, oh, there's so many other questions, questions. Oh yeah, Galax. No, Galax, Galax was for the UV, but Galax wasn't a, a great observatory, unfortunately. I wish it had been. Ooh, um, Eight-year-old Penelope asks, how do you use the dip of light at certain wavelengths to find different gases in the atmospheres of exoplanets? Sorry, can you say that again? I interrupted. Uh, yeah, no, no problem. How do you use the dip of light at certain wavelengths to find different gases in the atmospheres of exoplanets? Right, great question. So certain gases uh will absorb very strongly at very specific colors of light and so if you split up all of the light into the different colors and then at each color oh we each wavelength you measure the size of the dip some of those dips might be the same size but some of those dips might be a lot bigger and so if a really big dip happens at the same wavelength where a gas absorbs very strongly, then you can say, "Oh, that gas, th that gas must be in the in the in the atmosphere." Um, so yeah, it's basically the planet will appear with the, when the planet passes in front of the star. The planet will appear bigger. It will block out more light uh, at those specific wavelengths because there's lots of things in the atmosphere that are absorbing very strongly at those those specific wavelengths. But those gases will probably let through all the other light of all the different wavelengths and only block out 
um, very specific wavelengths of light. And so when you when you look at this, how big the planet looks at that wavelength, it looks a lot bigger. So you can say, oh, there's lots of stuff of um, absorbing at that exact wavelength in the atmosphere. So it must be there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thanks, Penelope. Great question. Yeah. Yeah, that was great. Um, okay. Let's let's uh, let's go on from there, and uh, feel free to continue asking questions in our in our YouTube comments. Uh, even of Jessica, even though we'll move on to Matt for now, but we can we can readdress more questions at the end of all of all of this. Oh yeah, and I guess we haven't even talked at all about James Webb. We'll save that for after after Matt's talk because that's a whole other spiel. So um, <laughs> could tie in with my talk too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So yeah let's all mute and stop our videos except for matt and i'll let you let you do it thank you very much jessica you'll stick around i'll go thank get you. another beer um while we while we hear the insights that you're about to give us matt and then then we'll do more questions and then we'll do the pub trivia which should be super fun okay good luck matt all right let's uh let's see if this shares correctly It looks good. It looks real good. Okay. Well, um, today, well, I guess in four days is the uh, 30th anniversary of the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and you have the great honor of listening to a theorist talk about one of the great observatories. So uh, I suppose take everything with a slight grain of salt and any observers in the audience might uh, be able to correct any falsehoods that I'm spewing. But um, uh, my name is Matt Orr, and I'm here to talk to you about how fast galaxies are making stars. So if you're, you know, stuck inside these days, but have a window in the quarantine, you maybe you have a, a telescope set up or a pair of binoculars, maybe a rear window situation going on. Uh, or maybe you have just really, really, really good eyes, and you look up in the night sky and you see galaxies. Um, and when you see those galaxies, besides thinking, oh, those are some pretty smears of light, up in the sky. A um, next question might be, how fast are those galaxies making stars? Uh, and you might think, well, surely that's an easy question. You know, we figure that out back of the envelope. You know, we're cooking Campbell's soup in five minutes. And maybe for a stab at it, it looks like this. You say, well, how many stars are in that galaxy? And how old is the universe? That's a star formation rate. It's an average star formation rate. But already things are getting complicated because for one, you have to figure out how that light corresponds to the amount of stars in the galaxy. You know, how bright is a star? How bright is the average star? Um, and then you also have to figure out, you know, how old is the universe? And that gets into questions of cosmology quick. Also, I apologize for my neighbor's dog. He hates space. Um, but already we have a, an average star formation rate. It's not quite the question we were trying to answer. It's you know, it's how fast have galaxies on average made stars in the universe, not how fast are galaxies making stars. So we see we already have some complications. Now, if I were an observer, um, or perhaps when the theory money runs out, uh, to answer this question, I figure we'd probably have to go to a telescope. So what telescope are we going to use? As an Angelino, I have a, a distinct bias towards the great Californian telescopes. Uh, so maybe you'd go up to Mount Wilson. It's only an hour drive. Uh, they have the 100 inch telescope there and they have uh, the great history of you know Einstein visiting and they're still doing science up at Mount Wilson. Anyone from Los Angeles might not believe that. Um, they have the Chara interferometer up there. And you know, if, if you're feeling like spending a lot for your birthday, uh, it's only, I think it's like $1,500 to rent out the big dome for a night and you, they'll send along um, observing tech and they'll have someone that can operate the telescope and you can just look Look at the night sky to your heart's content. Um, but anyways, would we use Mount Wilson? It's got a 100 inch telescope. I think that's pretty good. But no, we're not gonna use Mount Wilson. Maybe we go to Palomar, drive down towards San Diego. Uh, you stop at the in and out on the way down there in Temecula. Um, they have a 200 inch telescope. And it's a little bit farther away from everything. The night sky is a little bit darker there. Um, maybe that's the place to go. 
it isn't, although they do really great science there. Um, there's a there's the PTF and ZTF, the Palomar Transit Factory, and the Zwicky Transit Factory, where they're looking for very short cadence changes on the sky. So they're looking for supernova and other things that happen over, you know, human time scales, over, you know, how the night sky looks different from night to night, not just what changes over the centuries. Um, but no, we're not going to go to Palomar, although Palomar is great. Um, maybe we take a flight out to Hawaii, go to the Keck Observatories. There's two of them, twice as nice. Uh, and those observatories, the, the mirrors themselves, they're segmented, so it's a bunch of hexagons all packed together. They're almost 32 feet across. Um, they're two 10 meter telescopes. Pretty, pretty impressive stuff. And a number of my friends um, who are observers uh, and who have the great virtue of being Caltech grad students uh, in observational astronomy, they get a lot of, um, not quite free, but they get a lot of observing time on Keck these days. Um, you know, they do great stuff but they're not always answering the question of how fast are galaxies forming stars. To do that, we're gonna use, well, tonight we're gonna use the space, the Hubble Space Telescope. It's in the name, it's in space, we're going there. Um, and it's it's not as big as the other ones. We talked about a little bit earlier in the um, live cast. It's only about eight feet across in terms of its primary mirror, but um, it has some really good virtues, both in terms of its instrument package and where it is being in space. Um, so. This is not to scale, but gives you an idea of what's going on. Uh, the space telescope is in space. It's in an Earth orbit. It's in uh, a low Earth orbit, or maybe depending on your definition, it might be in a mid Earth orbit, but close enough that the space shuttle could have gone to it and close enough that, you know, if Elon Musk decided he wanted to own it, I don't know what exactly what the laws are on space piracy, but maybe he could own it and maybe it'd be his after the James Webb launches. But anyways, why do we need to go to space to answer how fast galaxies are forming stars? Well, if you are, say, down at Mount Wilson, trying to observe a galaxy, the light's coming to you from that distant galaxy, and it's passing through the hundreds of millions of trillions of trillions of miles of space between you and the galaxy, and just about the same distance to a telescope. But there's about 60 miles of atmosphere that uh, makes a real big difference. Um, now that atmosphere is really good at blocking ultraviolet light. Now you might not think it owing to the fact, especially if you're from Australia, um, owing to the fact, or New Zealand, um, owing to the fact that you have to wear sunscreen, but that's only because our sun is really bright by virtue of the fact that it's very close. Um, but other stars and other galaxies are far enough away that the atmosphere pretty much blocks all the UV light from them. And, and um, if we wanted to look at UV light, from another galaxy, you gotta be in space. So does you no good to go to Palomar or Mount Wilson or the Hawaiian telescopes? You gotta be in space, you gotta use Hubble. Or Sophia, if you wanna get on a 747 that has the back of it cut open. Um, Cause that's above most of the atmosphere, most of the water in the atmosphere that's blocking it. Uh, but anyways, what's so great about ultraviolet light? Why do I keep going on about it? Um, well, there's a couple of key features of ultraviolet light that we need to dig into. Gives you sunburns. That's not very good. It's blocked by most atmospheres. Also not very good for this specific application that I want to talk about, but it tells us a lot about young massive stars. Again, we'll note that that's very important. And again, uh, we talked a little bit about exoplanet searches and some of the stuff that people have done with Hubble in the past. And those things have relied on looking in the ultraviolet and sort of the redder side of the spectrum. But here I really want to talk to you about the bluer side and past blue into the ultraviolet. Well past violet, it's superviolet, ultraviolet. Uh, the shorter wavelengths being more energetic, they tell us something very interesting about young massive stars. So again, it seems like I might be getting off topic that um, I'm talking to you about ultraviolet light and sunscreen when I should be talking to you about how fast galaxies are making stars, but there's a connection here. It's not all that tenuous, but um, we, we gotta step through it a little bit here. Hot things glow. That's kind of the first thing you gotta know. Be it fire, you know, pokers in a fireplace or molten metal in a foundry, uh, or a star floating in space, being hot and doing its thing. Hot things glow. Second thing, the brighter the thing. Now, you might have had some experience of this when you've been standing in the aisle at Home Depot deciding, do you want to put a 50 watt light bulb in or a 100 watt light bulb uh, incandescent? Now, the 100 watt light bulb is going to draw more power, it's going to be hotter 
and it's going to be brighter. So brighter things are hotter things. And finally, the hotter the thing, the bluer the thing. Now, that might be a little counterintuitive uh, to some, but the fact of the matter is, the idea that blue is a cool color is somewhat incorrect, at least in some circles. Um, and that's, I think, a very interesting fact that as objects get hotter, where they emit the most light, where they emit most of the heat, becomes the light is bluer and bluer over time. Now, truth be told, our sun, if our eyes could detect the peak of its radiation, would be somewhere in the green as opposed to the yellow orange that we see, but it's really kind of just overwhelming our retinas. Uh, the sun would lie somewhere in the greenish range. But as you get, you know, if you have other objects that get hotter and hotter, they go from a dull red or maybe not glowing at all to red to a bright orange. And our eyes see white, but eventually the peak of that radiation is marching into the blue side of the spectrum. And all the while, the amount of light that's ultraviolet is increasing. So the hotter you are, the brighter you are, the bluer you are, and the more ultraviolet light you're giving off. That's one of the key features here. So again, hotter stars have bluer light. And that's really the key if we want to figure out how quickly galaxies are forming stars. Now, what makes for a hotter star? Does that have, what does that have to do with young stars? What does that have to do with star formation? Well, in the immortal words of Eldon Tyrell, if you have a VHS copy of Blade Runner sitting around, I think you should pop it in after this talk. But the light that burns twice as bright burns half as long. And it's really a key feature in this, that as you get more fuel and pour more fuel in the flame, AKA just dump more stuff onto stars, they are hotter and they burn quicker. They burn through their fuel much faster. Um, if you're feeling like you don't have much to read these days and have gotten through the New York Times, you know, top 100 bestseller list or something, I recommend uh, Introduction to Stellar Astrophysics, Volume 3, Stellar Structure and Evolution. Um, I don't get anything from this. I haven't written a book yet. But the, the key here, though, is that things that burn more burn quicker. And um, you know, if you have a bonfire, you might have had some experience with this. But it's a very key and interesting feature that when you put more stuff on stars, the center of them gets denser and denser, and it gets hotter. But the nuclear reactions that are happening in those stars don't just get hotter in or quicker in proportion. They get quicker much, much, much faster. So there, it's the kind of insane thing where if you were to double the pressure inside our own sun, it wouldn't double the rate it was burning through its fuel. It would go through its fuel at 10 to the 10 times faster. That really there is a, a hard limit that you're pushing up against where you're, you just start burning. It's a fire sale, you're burning everything. So the, the thing that is interesting here is that bigger stars are bluer and they're burning through their fuel faster. So they don't stick around for as long. So the key takeaway here is that if you see blue light, those stars are pretty young, that really they can't have been around for all that long. And so a star like our own sun, although it might've been a, you know, it's a good veteran of all the stellar wars it's been through, you know, it's been sticking around for four and a half billion years or so. And it's got another four and a half billion or so years to go. You know, maybe not as many as red dwarf or a smaller star that could burn for 100 billion years or so, uh, the bigger stars than our own sun, if you have a sun that's, or a star, you, know, you might call it your own sun, you know, if you have another star that's been around, you know, been around the block for 10 million years, but you happen to be about 40 times the mass of our sun, only 40 times, you know, that's not, that's not crazy, that's the difference between one person and a classroom of people, um, 10 million years is getting close to the end of that star's life, and that's, a thousand times shorter than the lifetime or the projected lifetime of our own sun. And so bluer, bigger stars don't live for very long. So if we see them, we know that they came to be fairly recently and thus giving us an idea of the rate at which stars have been forming, at least in that area of that particular galaxy or perhaps our own galaxy. Um, but finally, there's this connection that we're lacking, you know, if, we care about bright blue stars, big bright blue stars, um, and we want to know the rate of star formation. The important thing is knowing, well, how many bright blue stars do we make? Oh, my hand's in the frame. How many bright blue stars do we make when we make stars? Because not every star is big, bright, blue. 
And again, it's the blue stars giving off most of the ultraviolet light that we might care about for putting in a Hubble proposal, perhaps. You know, the theorists love Hubble too, not just the observers, because you can put in a, a Hubble theory proposal and you can get financial support, thus keeping you in a job for a little bit longer. Um, that's just an aside. That's the um, way to do it. That's, what, that's what's keeping me alive. And how. I, I, I frankly actually don't know where my funding is coming from right now. So maybe here's the Hubble. We'll see. <laughs> uh, but anyways, so how many stars are big, bright, and blue when we make stars? Um, well, an easy way to figure this out, you look at a young star cluster, like one of the clusters pictured. Purposefully, I chose this photo. It's a NASA astronomy picture of the day, but it came from Hubble itself taking a picture of a star cluster. Um, I didn't write down in my presenter notes what star cluster this is, but you could find this if you searched the NASA astronomy picture of the day uh, for star cluster. So good luck to all you internet sleuths out there. Um, but when we look at a star cluster like this, we have a reasonable idea that the stars all formed at the same time. Now, there's a couple of ways we can figure this out, but at the end of the day, the key fact of the matter is these stars all formed about at the same time. So if it's a fairly young cluster, we can look at it and just count up the number of young stars that are red and small and the number of young stars that are big, blue, and very bright. And we get something that looks kind of like this. Um, this is something that we call the initial mass function, aka how many stars do you get of what size? And the key matter is you get a lot of stars that are small, and not many stars that are big. For every 100 stars like the sun, you get one star that's about 10 times the mass of the sun. So if you make, if you make 10,000 suns, you get one star that's 100 times bigger than that. Now, interestingly, a star that's 100 times bigger than the, our own sun only lives for about 3 million years, which is frankly pretty insane because 3 million years, you can go through 20 of those stellar lifetimes before you, 22, uh, until you get back to the dinosaurs, which is pretty insane that there's, you know, there are stars that have born, been born, lived, died, and done that for 20 generations, effectively, since the dinosaurs, which, you know, usually we think that Things happen on crazy long time scales. And depending on your perspective, that might be a crazy time scale. But from someone who cares about star formation, that's a really short amount of time. And so the interesting thing, again, is that big, bright blue stars are very, very rare, relatively speaking. Um, and so when we see UV light, that bright, super violet light from those big, bright blue stars, it's hot, bright blue stars. Well, we know that they also brought along all of the little guys too. There's a bunch of stars like our own sun and a bunch of stars smaller than our sun. Many more, in fact, many more times the number of stars that are smaller than our own sun. Um, and so you can calibrate for, you know, if I see one of these bright blue stars, I know that it came along with all these other ones. So at the end of the day, I duplicated that slide for no reason it seems. Uh, at the end of the day, you can get a better idea of what's going on now in galaxies if you look at the UV light, because you can say, well, okay, I know that there have been a few of these big bright blue stars that have formed recently. They can't live for that long, so they must have formed recently. And so they correspond to some amount of stars that have formed in the very recent period, be it a few million years, or depending on the lifetime of it, you might be calibrating this for a few to maybe 30 million years. And so you can tell what's happened in the very recent history of galaxies. Now, mind you, many of these galaxies, like our own Milky Way, were formed 10 billion or more years ago. And so this is you know, just what's happening now, but it still gives you a very good idea. And you can calibrate this for other kinds of light as well. But today I've talked about ultraviolet because of the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and it really gives you an idea of what's going on in galaxies and what are they doing now, um, which is a, you know, what are they doing now now? Um, which is the important thing. So again, if you're asking how fast are galaxies making stars, it's not an easy question. It's a hard question. So with that, um, thank you. I haven't given this talk before, so it's kind of rough, I guess, but. I think, it, I think it was pretty good. I think you did a good job, Matt. 
none of these slides have been recycled, and that is saying something for me. So that was great, Mark. Yeah. Was cool. yeah. I don't think it lives up to the trash orbit comments from before. <laughs> it's still you cool. know I I try my best when it's <laughs> other people's talks. <laughs> but anyways. Um, all right, so there were some questions that we had. Um, oh, well, going. so there's there's one question. Oh wait, do you have a do you have a question, Jessica? No, oh, sorry, but I just took a sip of my quarantini. It's too strong. <laughs> yeah, I had to go to a to another beer. I have a a space a space themed beer. Really oh. happy with this. Oh. The Stone Viking Space Probe Double IPA, and it's good but quite strong. Thank you, Stone. These American beers, I tell you, it's, yeah, they make them strong here. Yeah. <laughs> especially, especially the the Coors Banquet, the strongest beer I know. What? What is it? Is that like MGD for Coors? No, it's a regular Coors, but they have a fun uh, a Miller High Life can these days. I don't know if it was for the quarantine or just because it was cheap to reuse marketing material from the 30s. I like oh. Oh. So there's there's a good a good question from Ivana Escala in our audience. What about using the light from evolved stars to look at the star formation in the past instead of now? So that is a excellent question. Uh, a really, really, really good question, in fact. Um, you can so stay on here, Jessica. The, the big thing about using light from evolved stars is at some point the light starts to look all the same. Namely, you can tell a star that's lived for, or you can tell a part, you know, a collection of stars that have lived for 3 million years or 10 million years or 30 million years because it still has these big bright blue stars. But at some point, a big part of this is because if you have one really bright blue star makes a big difference when you lose it and it explodes. Or if you have 10 eh, sort of blue stars and they explode. But things start getting different when you have 300 red dwarfs and 10 of them are a little bit uh, less, I guess, more red and a little less bright. And so it becomes harder and harder to tell stellar populations apart as they age. One of the big things is you know, if people are sitting in an audience at a talk, um, no one's going to believe you when you can say, oh, I can tell a 300 million year and a 400 million year stellar population apart. If they say that, they're lying to you. Uh, but you can definitely say, I can tell a 10 million year and a 100 million year stellar population apart. And so uh, the light from evolved stars, though useful, uh, starts to lose meaning as you try to look further and further back in time. This becomes difficult when looking at um, evolved stellar populations in dwarfs, or perhaps if you're trying to understand what's happened in the Andromeda galaxy uh, 100 million years ago or more. All right. All right. Sorry, I'm on a roll now that I've gotten through these. No, that's good. Uh, there's, there's some discussion in the chat about astronomy themed beers like the Lagunitas supercluster. I don't know your opinions on it. I've found that the astronomy themed beers for the most part haven't really lived up to my expectations. There's a space dust IPA from Elysian, which I don't really care for. The 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 supercluster, yeah, I don't I don't remember thinking it was all that. I do like this. I like this Viking space probe beer. But it's what about rever the reverse? What about um beer themed astronomy? Like the Trappist? Oh, like Trappist One exoplanetary system. Yeah, I dig that. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. Are there other beer themed astronomy? I don't Pro know. Probably. There should they're be. All, oh, they're all a bunch of alcoholics, astronomers. They're probably there are. Should, there that's should be common. more of that. Maybe I'll incorporate that. So, yeah, so you brought up the Hubble Space Telescope theory grants. That's what's. That's what's paying my the bulk of my salary right now. Not to run these events. This is for fun, but um, to to do the science that I work on on galaxy evolution. So, hail Hubble! Thank you, thank you for your funding and for your science. The Sophia um, Airborne Observatory also had a similar uh, theory grant um, payout. Sort oh, of. really? Yeah. So 
I don't, I don't know, know Sophia, what their uh, beer related events though. We should we should we should name something. Sophia related? Yeah. Uh, uh, of a beer. I'll I homebrew, so maybe I'll I'll brew a beer and I'll name it after Sophia infrared telescope. I mean, I think we we've got to just maybe we raise a glass every time Sophia takes off. Maybe that's <laughs> that's what we do. Although that'd be like every night at like seven thirty, so the perfect time. Yeah, the Germans run it like clockwork. Um, sorry, Sophia's uh, telescope is a retrofitted seven forty seven for those of you who haven't used Google um, to my obscure comments already, uh, and it's a joint project between NASA and the German version, the DLR. Um, and they do run it like clockwork. Yeah, right. So it's a big 747 where they've cut a hole in the fuselage and put, what's the size of the telescope? It's, a, it's like a eight foot telescope, 10 foot telescope. So it's, similar it's like a real deal. Size, similar to the, the aperture size of Hubble. Yeah. Just sticking out the side of a 747 and it goes up to super high elevation to get above the bulk of the atmosphere so that yep. you aren't suffering from like atmosphere. Most airliners are flying somewhere between uh, 30 and I think 38,000 feet. Uh, but uh, uh, Sophia flies at like 42,000. So they try to get a little bit higher to get above all the water in the atmosphere. I see. Um, and it's really interesting because the, the flight crew has to wear full oxygen masks the entire time they're above 40,000 feet in elevation. Because really? uh, the amount of time at that altitude that it takes for you to pass out uh, say the cockpit lost uh, pressure is shorter than it takes for you to get a mask on. So they have one of them has to be wearing the mask at all times, which is why apparently uh, regular airliners don't fly that high because they don't want the the crews uh, to have to wear masks all, at all times. Yeah, but presumably the difference between thirty eight thousand and forty two thousand isn't so great that. Like, yeah, but the, I guess the threshold is how long it takes to put the mask on. Maybe. Yeah, well, it's like seven seconds or something. Is at the 40, cockpit? Is the cockpit? The co cockpit must be pressurized though at forty-two thousand for these guys, right? No, it's just a regular seven forty-seven. So. Yeah. Well, but a normal seven forty-seven when we're well, I don't want to get super deep in this because people came to talk about astronomy about space. Also, there were some good questions in the in the chat. Oh yeah, yeah. What's oh uh, things have happened since we started down this? We started just muttering about nonsense. Muttering about it was, that's what. Uh, beers. How are the moons of Jupiter able to form water on them before they froze? Hmm. Ooh. Exoplaneteer. Perhaps you have some planeteer cool. information. Uh, yeah, I I actually don't know. I've not. I've never thought about that. I think probably there is, I don't know. So I think out when you're that far out, so Jupiter is five times further out, um, five times further away from the sun than the earth is. Yes. And when you're that far out, um, ice, like water ice freezes, um, yeah, water ice freezes there. Oh dear, I've had a couple of quarantines. <laughs> water <laughs> freezes out there, and I think it's easy. It's I, I think maybe there's probably more. You actually, it's easier to collect water. That's right, because all the vol volatiles from the interior just like blow out from the heat of the sun and everything. Exactly. Yeah, and it's easy. You can just collect. You can gravitationally like collect frozen water as well as liquid water. Um, so actually, I think the question is, how did we get so much water um, close in to um, Earth? Probably by like, maybe by like cometary comets, like dropping it pollution com pollution from comets. But actually, I think it's quite easy to. Um, there's a lot of water out there that doesn't get blown away by the sun. It did not get blown away by the sun's heat, and it froze into icy solids. And it's um, quite easy if you were like a even a small body. It's quite easy with your gravitational attraction to collect um, ice, even if it is frozen. Um, so you can still collect like solid ice as well. And so things further out actually tend to have higher water ice content than, than closer in, I think. That's fair. 
I saw a good uh, question here from uh, the Nerdy Walker. Uh, do galaxies that are nearer, say Andromeda, have a higher proportion of bright blue stars than those further away, such as those in the Coma Cluster? Um, I think this is actually a great question because it sort of can combine a couple of things. Um, so when we're looking further away, we're looking back in time. And one of the interesting things in the universe is that the rate of stuff falling into galaxies is decreasing in time. So less stuff is falling into galaxies in time. And so both when you're earlier in time, more stuff is falling into you, thus more stuff that can turn into stars. So star formation rates are higher. And then as a result, a, if you're forming stars and there's less stars to begin with because you're further back in time, a larger proportion of the stuff in your galaxy is young stars. And so today, not only is the star formation rate lower per sort of volume of the universe, but also you got more stuff. And so the you have a much lower proportion of bright blue stars. So earlier in the universe, things were bluer. And if you like blue colors, well, I guess it was better back then. But now it's a little more, you know, red. So I guess earlier it'd be like, you know, like Michigan go blue kind of status. Now it's like USC Cardinal, Cardinal and gold. Yeah. I think, I think you're shaping this to your specific worldview. I, I don't know how you could tell any of that. Yeah. Yeah. So, but it's true. Yes. At, at earlier epochs in the cosmological evolution, we had a, a bluer sky because there was more active star formation and thus younger, more massive stars pumping out more blue light. Right. A, a bluer sky at night during the day, it probably would have been just as blue. <laughs> well, actually, maybe less. Cause maybe there'd be less oxygen in the sky. But, would, um, would you be able to have, like? Would you be able to have noticed that, like, to a human eye? Would it, if you looked out, would they just have seen looked more bluer to a human eye? That would be that would be cool. Hmm. I actually don't question. know because I guess like when I look up in the night sky, I'm I'm not seeing like a lot of red dots because my eyes are cruddy. So <laughs> it probably looked like the same, but. Well, part of it is just our eyes, our cones and our rods in our eyeballs uh, are not very sensitive to color. Cones aren't very sensitive to low light conditions. And so when you look out in the night sky, you don't, it's, it's more difficult to detect the difference between red and blue stars simply because you're receiving very little light from them. Uh, so even if the, if there were more blue light Two billion years ago, or four billion years ago, at a younger stage in the in the solar system evolution, it'd probably be just as difficult to perceive the blue light then, simply because we just our eyes, the aperture of our pupil isn't large enough to a, allow enough light through, and our our cones are just not that sensitive to low light conditions. Yeah, hence the you know if you want to look at if you want to see like a nebula or andromeda say you can see andromeda with your your naked eye you got to look like a little bit away from where it is because your rods and cones are actually kind of like it's actually your night vision is worse in the central part of your vision for some reason right you got to look like a little bit away because yeah, you have you have a predominance of cones in the center the center pointing of where you're looking so you can better perceive color where you're looking and you have a higher uh but your rods are better rods at seeing the periphery of your vision. Space. And rods are better at looking at low light conditions. Um, I see a question about stellar evolution. Uh, yeah, well, that's appropriate for you. We'll, we'll take one more question. And I know there's one user in particular who's very anxious that we have not begun the pub the trivia, trivia section. So yes. we will begin that. So lay into that star formation question. We will begin the pub trivia and... So, do blue stars ever create yellow or red stars? Now, I did talk a little bit about how blue stars explode or have a tendency to explode, um, which is awesome in the classical sense and in, like, the modern sense. Um, but, yeah, blue stars, there are blue stars that become yellow or red stars. And there are yellow stars that become redder or yellower and redder stars. So, for instance, our own sun being a star that won't become or go supernova at the end of its life cycle will become a red giant. So as it, we run out of fuel in a couple billion years, 
it'll slowly build up and sort of blow out its atmosphere, thus cooling off paradoxically, even though it's kind of blowing things out, um, becoming redder as it cools. Uh, so the sun will become red and then eventually, like most, pretty much all stars that don't go supernova, um, it'll shed its outer layers going sort of red and it'll leave a white dwarf in its center, which is, um, is it a red dwarf? No, it's, it's, a, it's a white dwarf. It's a white dwarf. Okay, I'm just, you know, it's like, I didn't read the whole stellar, stellar astrophysics book because I just wanted to make sure I wasn't lying to everyone. Um, but anyways, it leaves just like the core of the old star and it's actually really bright and hot and small. Um, and so it's a very blue kind of remnant that's left for a while. But since it's pretty much not burning fuel anymore after it blows everything off, it just cools down forever. So it goes from a blue-ish thing to a bluish orangish thing to a yellowish thing to a reddish thing to a very red thing to eventually it'll become a black dwarf which no one ever talks about because they don't matter for stellar evolution or galaxy evolution but it's like kind of a cool end game thing um when it's just a blob of nothing that's like the temperature of the universe so blue things do become yellow and red things but only after they stop burning fuel and if you're interested you should totally buy a stellar astrophysics book on Amazon. <laughs> you sound like you're like a salesperson here for. You know what? It's like I could sell globes. I could, I could sell anything. With that mustache, you can sell anything. Oh, well, you got right. stars. You can buy stars. All right, let's uh, <laughs> let's let's move on to the um, the trivia section. To the pub trivia. I think I think this is gonna work. All right, so for the pub trivia. Uh, like our normal events, I put together a slideshow, but rather than, because there's no way to really do this in an interactive manner where you fill out a form and I know that you haven't cheated, and then I give you a prize, we're just gonna do this where I'll present the question and you guys have like, we'll kind of yap about it for 20 seconds and you kind of internally say, oh, I think I know the, I think I know the answer. And you can put it into the, the YouTube spreadsheet to prove that you knew that answer before I said it. And I can kind of go through and be like, oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, no, sorry. No, 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 it's not so good. And then we'll we'll talk about the answer. I'll ask these two. I don't know if they'll know. They might not know. There's some challenging questions. And then we'll just do that. So let's see if I can screen share. If I well, yeah. Let me let me know if this works. Can you guys see? Can you see an astronomy on tap? Yep. Okay. All right. So question one: What is the largest planet in the solar system? Wait, are we supposed to answer this? You, well, I'm I'm asking the audience, and I'm also oh. asking you guys to to oh. to really reveal. How much you actually, how much those PhDs really paid off? It's actually the moon. The moon is really far away. And that's why it appears so big. It's even bigger, really, in real life. <gasps> it is not the moon. I'm going to reveal that. Jessica. Oh, well, I, I, Matt, do you want to take this? No, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> how big the moon is? It oh, it automatically. Oh, I didn't even put it on oh. auto. Oh, you, you, you revealed it you too far. Me. Oh, shit. I have to. I'm oh. sorry. Pardon my. Oh, Lord. you're revealing all the questions. They can oh, see. Oh, no, don't, don't look at those. Stop. Oh, my gosh. Stop. <laughs> I, have to, I have to change this so it's not self playing. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. Okay. We're back. Okay. So the answer for those of you who didn't know is Jupiter. Jupiter is the, the largest and the most massive planet in the in the solar system you can fit about 10 11 ish uh earths side by side across the diameter of jupiter so jupiter holds something on the order of a thousand earths inside of it which is kind of nuts once we dropped a satellite into it just to see what would happen just to cool. see. and we'll and it's not the last time no so this juno is going to do that anytime now that's right juno i think is set to continue to observe uh, Jupiter for another 
year and a half, something like that, which is they pretty were, exciting. They were doing a finite number of orbits, which is a really cool length to a mission. And you, does it still show up as full screen or does it not anymore? Yeah, I think we might be able to see your answers. Oh, We're shoot. Not. Okay. Well, I can't look at, I can't look then at the YouTube, uh, the YouTube, like if people are getting this or not, because I have to leave it on full screen. Okay. Uh, a lot of people got it. And then okay. a lot of people put in troll answers. Oh, yeah, troll. We, I, like, I do like troll answers. Okay. Well, I'll move on to the next one, but you guys will have to be my eyes on the ground as to what right. people are people are saying. Right. So, question two, slightly more challenging. What is the largest moon in the solar system? I'm going to stick with my consistent theory that the moon is much bigger than the earth. <laughs> And so that we are, in fact, the largest moon in the solar system. That's, that's an interesting theory. That's yeah. an interesting theory. Oh, I see. Oh, no. I haven't stayed up at night with a, a sextant and a ruler and no, tried you, to figure out the motion of the heavens. But You've got a cool, like, funny theory. Now I actually have to think of the answer. You leave me, I haven't got a joke. And I actually am not exactly sure. Is it? It's okay <laughs> if you don't know. You study <laughs> other solar Ganymede. systems, not our Oh, no, they've already said it. Ganymede. I think it's Ganymede. Big Mama. Somebody says Big Mama. Big, big Mama is the answer. Of, Correct. <laughs> but is it actually our own moon? We're getting a lot of Ganymedes. No, there's one definitely bigger than uh, bigger than Mercury. Wait, bigger than the moon. There's definitely Mercury, Mercury is the biggest star in our solar system. Come okay. on. All right, all right, all right. Enough of this misinformation. The answer is Ganymede. Oh, it just was... barely bigger than our own. Ganymede. Yeah, not... Ganymede, as you can see here. So it's about 50% larger in diameter than our moon. But um, it's, I think it's something, well, you can make it out from the ratios here. It's about 40% the diameter of the earth, which is kind of crazy. Um, Ganymede, despite its name, is actually larger than Titan. You know, naively, you might think, oh, Titan, that's, Titan means big. So Titan, Titan's the one, but Titan is, uh, is the second largest moon. It orbits around Saturn. Ganymede is one of the Galilean moons orbiting around Jupiter, and it, it takes the crown. It takes you the can, crown. You can see it with your naked eye, arguably. What? Or, um, what are you, you're making up no, stuff. No, this, this is actually a true statement. Your pupil, fully dilated, is about six millimeters, and theoretically, you can actually see the Galilean moons or de deduce that there is something around uh, Jupiter with your naked eye. You have the uh, angular resolution to tell them apart. Have you done it, Matt Or I, I have not because I have crappy eyes. But <laughs> hence, I have eyeglasses that make me look like I was born in 1954. That's true. It does. Um, it I wonder if, like, if before Galileo, like, w like, sure, you maybe you might be able to tell yourself that you can see it. There, there are rumors. There. Not rumors. Um, uh, there are like built into the myths of various cultures in Earth that Jupiter had a companion. And so it is thought that um, various uh, nomadic societies around Earth actually had people that determined at one point that there were companions around Jupiter. So arguably you could do it. Did you just make that up? Because that sounds no. like BS. No, it was a, like a first year physics question of like, What's the airy resolution, you know, of the sure. diameter of your eye at like visible wavelengths? All right. All right. At maximum separation, mind you. Okay. Well. Cool. Our audience should not go out tonight and just try and peer at Jupiter and see if you can tell that there's a we have bright some moon. Not? What else are you going to do? Oh no, you can absolutely see the binoculars. Yes, you can. It's so great. It's like what I think is my favorite thing to look at with binoculars. Oh yeah, no, it's super cool. Galilean moons. Yeah, it's super great. Cool. Trash what's eyes. What's somebody says. What's also interesting. Oh, <laughs> what's also interesting. Trash eyes, trash orbits. The the <laughs> Galilean moons. I didn't realize this until I was researching this quiz question. Um, so that I I knew that the Galilean moons. All of the moons are named after lovers of Jupiter from Greek mythology, but Ganymede, so Io, Europa, and Callisto were all women. Ganymede was a, a young male lover of Jupiter, which is pretty, yeah. It is great though. The JPL mission is literally, uh, you know, it's sending Zeus's wife to go check up on all the lovers. 
<laughs> Juno, Juno, that's right. All right. Next question. In what constellation in the sky is the famous Hubble Deep Field that Jessica Spake was talking about in her very presentation? We'll, we'll give a second to our audience. In the bottom of the sky. We have to say, oh, no, I actually don't know. Pis well, think, but think about it this way. Think about it this way. If you're if you're looking into the galaxy, uh, and you're trying to look as deep as you can. You don't want to deal with dust, and you don't want to deal with stellar crowding. So, in what direction of the galaxy do you look? Just away from the galactic. You look through Bode's hole. What? There's the the gap in the dust. No, Bode's no, no. That's towards the galactic center. We're not trying. You want to go away the from the galactic. No, center. it's it's. I thought it was the north. The Bode's hole. Oh, Bode's. I thought you meant Bada's Bada's gap. Bo okay. Well, maybe that's. Maybe I'm wrong. I... Okay. You just Bada's want to look away from the galactic plane, right? You, want you to don't look want to look in the galactic plane. Look what you away, want to look away. is here, here's the answer. Ursa Major. Oh yeah, somebody said Ursa Major. Somebody Great got dipster. that. We got a lot of Virgos. Cygnus. One, yeah. It is someone. not the big dipster, Matt. Over. Big dipster. Dipster. <laughs> X represents the location of where on the sky, relative to the Big Dipper, where you where you see the 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 Hubble Deep Field, and this, as you as you know, as Jessica showed in her image, this is an image of the. This is actually the Ultra Deep Field, but it's all in the same location. It's just the Big Dipster is in there. No, no, the Big Dipster is not. That's. That's from that television program. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, so True. the original ultra, uh, the original deep field was taken over the course of 10 days in 1995, 96. And it just was like, we're going to stare at this section of space forever. Well, not forever, for like 10 Only days. 10 days? Yeah. Wow. That's a lot. A, that's a cheap that's a lot of Hubble time. It's a lot of Hubble time. Yeah, so one orbit of Hubble. Oh, yeah, there was a question. Well, we'll deal with the questions after this. The questions about docking with the ISS. Anyway, question four. After the, oh, I like this because it's quarantine related. After the Apollo 11 astronauts returned from the moon, how long were they held in quarantine? This is it was only as long as it took Buzz Aldrin and hamburger, I remember. That guy, that guy likes his hamburgers. That guy likes his hamburgers. Yeah, so when the original Apollo astronauts, they landed on the moon and they came back, everyone was like, oh, they might bring back some parasite or some, some disease from the surface of the moon. We can't infect the entirety of the, uh, the, the human species, kind of Andromeda strainy. Uh, and so they, they quarantined them. They threw them in the back of this Airstream trailer. As soon as they picked them up on the on the aircraft carrier and kept them there for a certain period of time to make sure that whatever they may have acquired on the surface of the moon wasn't some sort of disease or virus that was going to spread to the entire human population. So well, what do people think? We've got some good answers on the chat. Yeah. A lot of people say in two weeks. A lot of people say in two weeks. Some people say 10 days. Rebecca Larson says three weeks. <laughs> McLaugh nine says until COVID one was over. A lot of <laughs> Todd Mitchell said yeah. COVID time. A lot of Andromeda strain was big at that time, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. So I can't. Uh, yeah, my my guess is biased now by the chat feed. I'm going to say two weeks. That seems to be the the, the consensus. The, the consensus, yeah. Really interestingly, when they landed, they decided that they could not just lift the Apollo capsule and put it on to the carrier that they were picking it out of the ocean on. They thought, no, we've got to get this under control even before they're on the carrier. So what they did was they threw divers into the ocean to swim out to the, the capsule and they opened the window or sort of the, the door and threw them their like quarantine suits to put on, to get out of their flight suits and put on their quarantine suits. And all of the astronauts apparently said they were most worried about the fact that, you know, when we open this door, all the stuff's going to get out anyways, and it's just yeah. going to get into the ocean. Yeah. And 
you know, they were worried that, like, you know, if we got something, it'll just get in the ocean anyways. But they said, eh, screw it. We're just going to put you in these uniforms. And so apparently that's what they did. And they all said, well, if there was any, ever going to be contamination, the oceans could have been contaminated by the moon plague. So you're saying it, the, the contamination was not handled very well in the initial Apollo 11. No, but they tried. They tried. Yeah, that's hard. They did have the fill-in customs. The, the answer, for those of you keeping tabs, 21 days. 20 oh. days full three weeks. Yeah, they couldn't even Rebecca, shake Nixon's hand. Rebecca Larson was right. Well oh, done. nice work, Larson. Yeah, so here you, see, here you see an image of Nixon approaching them to go like say, hey, congratulations, you jokers. But they couldn't even come out and say thank you president of the United States because they were trapped in this airstream, which I find pretty funny. It also kind of puts in perspective our own quarantine right now because they were trapped in a trailer. Now, I don't know about you guys. I'm in a studio apartment that's like 200 square feet. It sucks. I'm like trapped in here and I don't have anywhere to go. And I, I think they even, they probably in an airstream is probably even small. It's like a hundred square feet. So they I don't moved know. around in that from the where they landed the ship to the Johnson Space Center. What's that? They they moved them around in that, so they were like dragged. Oh yeah, exactly. It was like deposited on the the uh, aircraft carrier, and then they were like stick it in the back of a plane and fly that around, and they were just always like oh, moving around, having a beer. They parade them around. Yeah, they they moved them from Florida where the carrier came in to. Um, Johnson Space Center, or the um, Houston, yeah. Ellington Air Force Base, where they were for a little while. So, it puts our quarantine in in context, I guess. Although we didn't all just go to a foreign planetary object. They were also quarantined for a few weeks before the mission as well. Oh. So as to make sure that both they wouldn't get sick while they were doing the mission, and that they were absolutely sure that anything that they did catch would be a lunar virus. Oh, I see. Instead of some sort of domestic yeah. event. They apparently had to shoot off Nixon because Nixon wanted to have a meal with them before they launched, like the night before. And they were like, sorry. Sorry, Tricky Dick. Keep your distance. <laughs> All right, question five. Which comet in the sky this year is believed to have originated outside of our solar system? Oh. I have no idea, so I'm not even going to mention Jessica, it. Jessica has some I, ideas. I do, know, I do know that one, but maybe I'll let the audience. Yeah, let, let the audience have their, their pick at it, and then, then I'll let you give the big reveal. Big reveal. Oh, yeah, it was uh, Big Papa, right? Wait. <laughs> oh, no. The answer is not Big Papa. <laughs> big, ba big Mama. Not big Papa. <laughs> long, long Mama. Rendezvous with Rama, great Philip K. Dick novel. Wait, I haven't read that. I like I like PKD, but I haven't read that one. Well, that's it's a really good one. He's a he's a very imaginative author. He's a little bit he's very imaginative. I won't was, say anything. He was Arthur C. Clarke. Oh, oh we've had Arthur one. Wait, I'm not sure. I think. <laughs> um, yeah, we're getting some answers. One of them is. I can see what somebody's got the right answer already. Should I do you want to read some of them out? Sure, lay it on me. One answer is Rebecca Larson. Uh, one is Dodge Comet, Borisov, HR10, the thing that looks like Rama, Rama, Borisov. But do you want to, I, we have had Eric W said Amua Amua. Loads of people saying Borisov right now. I'm not sure why. All right, all right. Or oh, is that something? Maybe Dodge I'm, Comet, Dodge Neon, perhaps. So, so well, it's 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 not a trick question, but it can be easily confused because Oumuamua oh. was an inter-solar system object, an interstellar object, but it wasn't a comet. Oh, I got it wrong. What it was an wrong? asteroid. It was oh, an asteroid. Oh, God. How embarrassing. Whereas we have since then, since Oumuamua came through the solar system, we've had... 21, I'm sorry, not 21, 2i. Two 2i I. Two yeah. I Borisov. Come oh, on. I don't know what I'm chatting about. Take away my PhD. Oh, oh no. <laughs> okay. So 
Borisov was discovered last fall. Well done, Borisov people. Yeah, good the... job, Borisov. He was an amateur astronomer, as many of these comet discoverers are. Discovered it as it was coming in, and it's looking at the trajectory of it. I have a little video here that also compares it with Oumuamua. Whoa. So yellow is Borisov, and you can see it came in from out of nowhere. It bent around the sun and is headed out. It's not gravitationally bound to our solar system. It had like way more orbital energy. Yeah, 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 exactly. Its eccentricity is like three or something like that. It's way, way, it's not bound. So it, it just passed in close. It passed in at about the, the nearest uh, orbital distance to the sun was around Mars's orbit. And then it went, we were supposed its to closest see. approach was around New Year's. And yeah, its trajectory means it came from not within our solar system. It's in here for a couple years and then it's headed out. And in fact, there was a paper published today that indicated that it has a substantially larger carbon monoxide com component in its outgassing compared to other solar system based comets, like a factor of 10 or 20 times higher, which the indicates it has a ton of carbon monoxide ice that's present in it, which indicates that it had to have formed in a much colder temperature environment to have carbon monoxide ice form such a large component of its of its mass, which is super exciting because this really gives us some some in depth clues into how so other stellar systems and the planetary systems around other stars and comets will form in a way that we haven't really had any kind of information because we've been stuck in our own solar system. So this totally ties into the work, you know, exoplanetary work that you're doing, Jessica, and 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 even the the other stellar formation work that you're doing, Matt. So it's it's really exciting. Yeah, this is the incredible. red line is Pluto. The red line, yes, the, the red line that the red is circle. orbiting, that's in a bound orbit around the solar system that's off the plane of the rest of the, the, the planets in the solar system is Pluto. But the red line that's coming in and flinging out is Oumuamua, which is the asteroid, the inter, interstellar asteroid that uh, passed through the solar system, what, like, in the last two years. These so. discoveries are amazing. They're both, yeah. like... They both happened like very close together and both, yeah, just reshaped, I don't know, they reshaped how I felt about the universe. Like these interstellar objects coming into our, our solar system. Yeah, what I'm wondering is like, were we not sensitive to this yeah. 10 years ago? Is this just yeah. a product of our increased technology and a be able, uh, ability to be able to sense these objects? Or is this just a coincidence that all of a sudden, bam, we have these two interstellar objects that just happen to pass through our solar system? I mean, I was reading that this was an expected one to two a year event that before we had NeoCam and some of the other objects that we're looking for, uh, Earth crossing orbit objects, that we just weren't really looking for them before. And so that you know, this is the kind of thing that's been happening for a long time. But we just haven't been, we haven't been sensitive to it. Yeah. So and I remember reading um, somewhere in the archive um, an estimate for whether or not over time we should expect the number of solar system entering objects to increase or decrease, whether or not there should have been more in the past and those would have contributed to, you know, meteor strikes or sort of asteroids depositing material like in Antarctica, say, where people, where we get like most of our, um, like that's where we get most of like the meteorites that land. Meteorites. Sure. It's like, easy to pick up a black rock on a sheet of white ice than yeah. on some other terrain, so yeah. Well, the easiest place to pick up asteroids is actually out of the wells that they dig for the uh, Antarctic station because they just like stick a hot rod in the ground it melts a bunch of ice and thus all the rocks and all the melted ice end up at the bottom of the melted cavern and so they right. just like scoop all the stuff up right so that's fair but yes um, you're right we had a couple of questions in the chat oh yeah Rajesh Gaga asked why can't we land something on Boris off chat where it goes and I think Eric W's kind of already he answered that is it 
they're moving too fast, right? It's we've yeah, got no. These things, these things are blazing through the solar system yeah. at a really, really fast rate. And in fact, Borisov, when it's headed into the outer solar system, is moving uh, at a few times the rate of of the Voyager missions that we sent out, you know, 50 years ago into the outer solar system to 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 discover and and whatnot. So. No, it would be very challenging for us to get some sort of man-made object, human-made object, moving fast enough to be able to dock with one of these objects and and kind of stick some instrument on it and track it. It's not, it's not impossible, but with the technology that we have right now, it's extremely difficult and expensive, and we're just not spending. We're not ready to spend the money on that sort of thing yet. Not as someone who's dictating the. The priorities of NASA, but uh, it just seems like that's not one of the priorities that we have right now. I mean, if I had two priorities for NASA, first would be high-speed rail from LAX to Union Station. Second would be asteroid return mission. Third would be comet capture mission. Comet capture. See so all that delicious carbon monoxide that we could bring to our own, our own fountains and resources. Come on, there's like at least ten theses out of analyzing just like straight like oh what kind of carbon monoxide is coming out of this thing that's true okay let's move on we've we've talked about borisov for a bit Boris. question six edwin hubble made all of his most important contributions to astronomy at what observatory and i believe this was addressed in matt orr's presentation i know some fun facts about that so we'll see. We'll see if uh, we'll see if people in the chat comments can can figure it out. I've moved on to an eight oh five here. Quality. Uh -huh. Another. What's eight oh five? Is that the? Oh, we've had. Oh, we've had some comments. Oh yeah. Well, there's so far five Mount Wilsons in a row. Six. Are you drinking the shoots, Matt? I don't know if you were just copying it. Black Butte. Oh, Black Butte's good. It's the darkest stop. beer they had at Stater Brothers. Wait, someone suggested the answer is Dare Wolfskopf? Yeah. That's the joke. Oh. Ha. I don't <laughs> think Edwin Hubble, I don't think Dare Wolfskopf was a bar in Pasadena when Edwin Hubble was here. But. So fun fun fact about Mount Wilson, they got a chair on the observing deck at the 100-inch dome where they say that's where he observed Andromeda and figured out that Andromeda was another galaxy. Oh, that's yeah. cool. That the fun cool. fact is that chair is just a chair they took from the galley because they're like, yeah, he sat in one of the chairs and there are like six of them that are exactly the same. But he took he literally just took a chair out of the kitchen and put it in there. They couldn't figure out which one it was. So they just put one up there and they're like, that's the chair he sat in. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I worked yes. up at Mount Wilson for two years. The answer is, in fact, the Mount Wilson Observatory. Well done. Is, is proximate to all of us. It's uh so Mount Wilson is about six miles directly to the to the north of me it's it's just to the north of pasadena and to the north of los angeles sitting in the san gabriel mountains in the angeles crest national forest and yeah from 1906 1905 1905 was the 60 inch dome yeah so 1905 the 60 inch telescope was built and it was the largest telescope in the world and then it was replaced as the largest telescope in the world by itself when the 100-inch telescope was built in 1917. And it remained the largest telescope in the world until Palomar was built in the- 1948. Okay, all right. All right, Southern California. I guess you know your business. 1948. Let's just say there was something with a gate code. So Edwin, Edwin Hubble arrived to work at the Mount Wilson Observatory and the Carnegie Observatories, the Carnegie Institute uh, that ran the Mount Wilson observatories um, in, he arrived in like 19, around, I think 1918, 1919. So right after this telescope was built. So that's a pretty sweet job. Like you start your first job out of your PhD and you're an observer on the largest telescope in the world. Like, all right. 
He Sweet. reportedly spent the most time at Hearst Castle of anyone who ever visited. What? He spent like four or five weeks there uh, because Hearst found him so interesting talking about the discovery of Andromeda and all that. So he apparently spent the most nights uh, sitting right next to William Rudolph Hearst talking, I guess, out of his ass about uh, Andromeda of anyone who ever visited Hearst Castle. That's interesting. That's cool. Really interesting. Good, good early ninety, early nineteen hundreds California history. Yeah, I suppose so. Anyway, um, for people interested, you can go up, although not right now because of the quarantine. You, but because uh, it, because it, it's closed. But you can normally go up there. They offer tours. You can check things out, and if you and it's all free. But if you actually want to, they do rent out the telescope to enthusiastic and people who are willing to pay. They also and, have a good little sandwich shop. Oh yeah, there. the Cosmic Cafe. That's Cosmic pretty cool. Cafe. Yeah. So anyway, it's a pretty sweet spot, and it was the largest telescope in the world, and that's where Edwin Hubble did like some super impressive work that changed the face of our perception of the earth in the context of the universe. And there's still people observing the sun at Mel Yes, yes that is true. Ed Rose is a 60 inch, 60 foot, and um, some guy from UCLA, because it's UCLA, um, at the 150 foot tower. You needn't, you needn't cast aspersions on uh, UCLA just because of your USC well, life. No. Question seven. What object do we believe exists at the center of each and every galaxy? Speaking of UCLA. You know, I've got faith in our uh, um, participants. Sorry, go yes. on. Nothing exists at the center of UCLA. <laughs> no, but there is a, there's oh, a- Oh, you're right, you're right. It's an One empty... of the largest research groups on the topic of the object at the center of our galaxy exists at UCLA. Well, maybe. No, no, that is absolutely true. Andrea Gez's group is world class. They might be. <laughs> We've got so a few classes. What do you think, Jessica? Well, it's, it's kind of cheating, isn't it? Because I've got the help of all of our um, viewers. That's so okay. Even though I, I did have the help with the comment question, and I still got it wrong. So oh, that's there okay. we go. Some well, people well, say I'm, I'm like. I'm okay. like Alex Trebek here. I'm the I can be all all like, oh, I know all the answers because I wrote the damn <laughs> quiz and I looked up all the answers. So I can pretend like I'm uh, the smartest no, man in the room when I wouldn't know all of these answers. It's just because I looked them up. So <laughs> um That's I, I, I one of the answers. You wouldn't know these. I know you would know these. Um so we got a lot of black holes. Very good. A center A star. Supermassive black hole. Yeah. So in the center of our galaxy, you're right, Matt, is Sagittarius A star. There's not a Sag A star in every galaxy? No. So <laughs> supermassive black hole we believe exists in the center of every galaxy. And in our own Milky Way galaxy, the name for that supermassive black hole is Sagittarius A star. Sagittarius A star is because it sits in the constellation of, excuse me, too much beer, in the <laughs> constellation of Sagittarius, and it's um, it has an asterisk A star because it's a radio source because that's how the main way in which we observe it. It doesn't because it's a black hole. You can't really see a lot of optical light coming from it, but we infer the presence of it based on its. It is a radio source. And based on the presence of stars that are orbiting around some unseen object in the center. This image that we've shown here is the image in the radio of an object not in our own galaxy, but in the supermassive black hole sitting in the M87 galaxy, which is a reasonably nearby massive elliptical galaxy in the Virgo cluster. And it was put forth by the, the Event Horizon Telescope Consortium which has done amazing work in the last couple of years. And it sounds like they're gonna have some, some other cool results potentially involving our own Sagittarius A star, that is to say the supermassive black hole in the Milky Way. So I'm really excited to see some more results on behalf of them. And I know a lot of people kind of poo poo this whole picture and they're like, oh, it looks blurry. Oh, 
who cares? I can take a much better picture with my iPhone of stuff. And you're like, come on, guys, this image the the I don't remember the exact details, but the the size of that orange band, which is to say the the width, roughly the width of the black hole, or at least the black the width of the event horizon of the object, or the accretion disk of the object, is like holding a penny at the distance of 50 miles or something like that. You're not going to take an iPhone pi picture that's in good focus at that kind of distance. You just can't. So. I, I still remember like the week before the image was actually released, there was a ton of speculation in the department whether or not it would be the center of our galaxy or the center of M87. Right. Where basically M87 had a black hole that was a thousand times more massive. That's right. Even though it was a thousand times further away. So, you know, it was going to be about the same size on the image, but. We had betting pools. We had, you know, all sorts of stuff. Uh, yeah, Cameron lost a lot of money. That I, did, I didn't lose any money. <laughs> lost M87 dollars. No, but that's true that the Event Horizon Telescope was observing both Sagittarius A star, the supermassive black hole in our galaxy, the Milky Way, as well as the M87 uh, central supermassive black hole. And they only, in that grand data release, including this image, they only released the data associated with M87. They didn't release any of the information or the imagery associated with our own Milky Way's supermassive black hole. And talking with members of the team, it sounded like they just didn't have, it was a lot more variable and they didn't have, in terms of its brightness, it's fluctuating in its brightness and they couldn't produce as good, not just an image, but as good a data as they could associated with M87. But I believe that they've had an ongoing effort to continue to observe this and they'll be able to provide a similar or potentially better image of our own Sagittarius A star supermassive black hole at some point in the future. Although now with the pandemic, I mean, that throws everything up in the air in terms of trying to get collaboration between these various observatories to all observe at the, the exact same time to be able to produce this kind of data. No, no money was lost. No money was lost. Maybe some beer. Maybe some beer was lost. I bet Cameron $1,500. You, that is not true. <laughs> All I right, bet next, a bike. next question. Question eight. What meteor shower peaks tomorrow night, April 21st? The Aprilids. Very the little April, known. The Aprilids. The <laughs> very little known meteor shower. <laughs> The Aprilids. Any any answers in the in the chat? You know, while we're doing that, we gotta wait twenty seconds. I I really have to pee. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna. Oh pee. no! I needed that. Damn! I was gonna sneak off. Looks like I'm in charge of the chat now. <laughs> oh, we got some answers. Do what we've got. Oh. Oh, we got some good answers. But are they the right answers? It's all the same answer. And I can't tell if like somebody just, somebody puts a guess and then other people will just copy or do you well, guys- that, that would oh. belie a small amount of confidence in their own ability to guess. That's true. No, I have faith. I think these, I think our viewers, they know what they're talking about. They know disturbingly well. Yeah, I know actually it's worrying. Yeah. Some, it's worrying, they know more than I do. <laughs> I've only seen Star Trek 2. I haven't seen the other ones. So, like, how do they know so much about space? Oh, oh yeah. I... Is someone saying that the Aprilids are not a meteor shower? I don't know which ones they're talking about. The Aprilids? Or the... the Aprilids? Did someone put the Aprilids? No, they said it wasn't a meteor shower, which... It's true. They've seen through the our, our clever ruse. There is no Aprilids meteor shower. We're just making that up. Meteor showers are generally named after the constellation in which they the the astro are the uh, meteors in appear to come called the radiant. So all meteor showers occur because the Earth in its orbit around the Sun is passing through some sort of stream associated with the orbit of another object, usually an asteroid or a comet. 
And so when it passes through that stream, uh, as it passes through, the sand grains and the, the rubble in that stream are coming into the atmosphere and they all appear to be coming from some direction on the sky. And so this particular one that's happening tomorrow night around, well, in about an hour, will, as it goes through, it'll all appear to come from one location on the sky called the radiant. And that radiant occurs in a constellation. And that is the name of this meteor shower. What are, what are people saying? The, the uh, consensus is the lyrids. That is correct. Well done. So the lyrids, here's an image of the, where the radiant of the lyrids will occur. If you look up, they're called the lyrids because they're proximate to Lyra the constellation of Lyra, which is pretty identifiable because that's where Vega, which is one of the brightest stars in the sky is, as you can see on this. They named Vegas after Vega. Yeah, that's not true. That's not true. <laughs> but if you look up in the sky around 11 p.m. tomorrow night on the Pacific, in Pacific time, that's around the time Lyra will be coming off of the eastern northeastern horizon and then you'll be able to see the location in between Lyra and Hercules where these, these meteors appear to be coming. But it's not a huge flux of, of, of meteors. They're like 15 an hour. So, you know, once every few minutes. However, this particular meteor shower does have a high proportion of fireballs where they, there's large pieces of, of rock, not just little sand grains, large pieces of rock that enter the atmosphere. And when they do so, they don't just streak across the atmosphere, but they actually leave a trail behind them, almost like a contrail. Oh no, we lost Jessica. Where did she go? Did she crash? Well, there were two Jessicas. Are both of them gone? I, I, I can't tell. I'm stuck in this full screen mode. I'm seeing both of them, but she might have. No, I'm here. I'll be back in a second. Sorry. Oh, she's here. She had to go to the bathroom too. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, anyway. I'm, we're getting called. Um, to... So, so tomorrow night, tomorrow night, if you are in a dark sky location, or heck, if you're in LA or Pasadena, I encourage you to go out around 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. and the the moon shouldn't be in the sky. You should be able to see this portion of the sky. Look in the east northeast and look up and hang out for 10 minutes. Let your eyes get light adjusted to the to the darkness and maybe you'll be able to see a, a meteor or two. Okay, question nine, we're almost done. Sorry, this is going kind of long. We're just yapping, drunk and yapping. We got nothing else to do in the quarantine, come on. In, in Star Wars, because there's always a Star Wars question, a lot of people belittle me for having Star Wars questions, but I really like Star Wars planetary questions. Which planet possesses a surface of crimson soil covered by white salt and is the location of the climactic battle at the end of episode eight? I know this one, but only because there's a um, salty subreddit based around it. Oh, is that true? There is. It's r slash saltier than blank. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah. Jessica, are you up to up to speed on Star Wars? Uh... Oh, yeah. You know what? Um, my mom and my brother are going to be furious that I don't know the answer to this. I love Star Wars. I was raised on it, but now I don't know the answer. That's okay. I'm not as I'm not as well versed on the the planetary systems in the in the the latter trilogies as the original. Hey. But. Um. But it does make for a very striking scene. I'm not crazy about episode eight as a whole, but this scene is really beautiful because as the spaceships cross the uh, the white salty plains, they they drive up this crimson mineral dust that makes it really. Oh, oh yeah, no, I don't, I don't know the answer. Um, Are people I, indicating that they I, they know the scoop based on the chat? Well, okay, so we've had Krakatoa, the worst Jedi. Ooh. Some people only haven't seen this. Um, Planet Margarita, Crate, Disneyland, Crack Crate. I like episode eight, to be fair, actually. You know what? Some people do like this. Um, yeah, those are the answers we've guessed we've had so far. Any of those hit? Yeah, Crate is the answer. Crate. Right, done. There's three people that 
got that right, I think. Good job, team. Oh, Creed two. is the answer. Hopefully by including this image, it's not going to totally negate the copyright status of this entire YouTube stream. <laughs> Disney is the, uh, the, the king of copyrights in this universe. But this is, yeah, one of the images at the final battle scene of Crate. And uh, yeah, it was beautiful. It was, the, oh, the yeah. cinematography was incredible. So well done, well done Star Wars, well done Disney. All right, and the final question, which was featured in our last Astronomy on Tap as a, a tiebreaker, but I, throw, I thought I'd throw it back in here because I really like this question and it's hard. After the USA and the USSR, what was the first country to have an astronaut in space? This is hard. I wouldn't have known this. I can have my, my clever holier than thou Alex Trebekness to this one, but it's only because I did the research and looked this up. I wouldn't have known this a priori. Japan? Is That's it? Guess, Matt, but it's incorrect, Matt Orr. Damn. I'll give you, I'll give you another hint. This occurred, this person went into space in 1978. West Germany. That is incorrect. Oh, we had a couple of guesses. The first one guessed the same as me. Um, should I just read the guesses out? Yeah, lay them out. Lay them varied, out. varied guesses. Okay, William Henry says India. Eric W says Israel. Micah Sittig says Canada. Neva Namjoshi says China, Todd Mitchell says Canada, Slam RN says China, any of those? Hit? Those are all good guesses and along the lines of what I would have guessed had I not known the answer, but they're all wrong. William Henry says from? There's GDR versus BDR. So during that period, the Soviet Union tied into a number of its neighbors and its politically aligned neighbors under the Iron Curtain and under other like communist or socialist nations like Mongolia or Cuba or China and and form something called intercosmos and intercosmos was a way of being like an international effort to go into space on Soyuz well it wasn't Soyuz at that point it was what was it I forget I forget the launch mechanism but they tied in essentially, essentially a bunch of iron, iron curtain nations. So the answer is Czechoslovakia, not a country that exists any longer. This guy is named- uh, really call it Czechia now? Well, Czechia, I believe is the Czech word for the Czech Republic, but, but uh, no, Czech Czechoslovakia, I believe was the, the word that everyone referred to that nation when it existed. And his name was Vlad Vladimir Remick. He's now a politician. He's still alive. And you can see, you can see in the lower left, he has the little intercosmos patch on his arm because that was, that's how he went into space. He went into space associated with the Soviet Union, but he was part of Czechoslovakia at the time. And like I said, this was all in 1978, which is kind of crazy. Mm. It wasn't that the Czech, the Czechoslovakian nation had their own space agency that was capable of putting people into space. They were just tied into the Soviet space agency, but kind of a cool little known fact. And again, I don't mean to play a holier than thou view because I wouldn't have known this had I not done the research for these questions. So Canada, India, China, Japan are all totally valid and viable answers to this. They're just unfortunately incorrect i should have guessed east germany yeah i think east germany would have been a better guess than than west so let me stop sharing that. but who had more medals in the olympics i don't yeah i don't know we'll let the chat decide I slovakia i don't think had had as many so anyway um are there any more let's see if if there are any more uh are there any more questions that we can Oh, thank you. Thank you, Rajesh, for the confirmation. Confirmation. Are there any other things that you guys would like to address before we adjourn? This has been fun. I hope our audience has had fun. I've had three beers that have been overwhelming, <laughs> but, but uh, I'll probably have a fourth.
My day tomorrow is going to be a wash. Yeah. Good, good thing group meeting was today. Yeah, it is a good thing our research group meeting was today. Not that it would have changed things. Are there any other uh, any other questions that people from the ball. have for us? We can we can maybe take another five minutes or so and and address things to celebrate Even Hubble Hubble and its thirtieth anniversary. Good job, Hubble. Yeah, well done, Hubble. Uh, Let's see, Neva Namjoshi asks, what is your favorite exoplanet? Oh my. I think that's a better question for Jessica Spake than it is for the rest of us. Yeah, but I'm so biased. That's okay. It's okay to be biased. <laughs> Mine is the one with all the gaps in the system. Trappist? Yours is the what, sorry? No, yeah, it's the HD blah, blah, blah. Um, There's a lot the of HD blah, blah, blahs. <laughs> Fair enough. It's the one with the it's the image of the proplanetary disk with a couple of gaps in it. Everyone spilled a lot of ink debating whether or not those gaps are real or uh, not. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. And I, I'd also argue that, like, arguably, like, do we know for sure that there is an exoplanet system? Like, those gaps also hotly may be caused by something else. So, you know, but maybe, is that why you like it? Do you like controversy? No, it's just really cool that we might be catching a system very early on in its formation. For sure. I think that's super interesting because it's legitimate that people might be asking, are those real gaps? Are they not? Mostly because, you know, we haven't really caught that many systems kind of in the disk phase of per planet formation. So, um, I, yeah, I also, yeah, that it's an amazing image as well. Really a feat. Um, of human, you know, science is great. Also, actually, Neva mentioned, what is my second favorite? My favorite one exoplanet is WASP-107b just because we found the helium on there, but super biased reason. But my second favorite is actually the TRAPPIST-1 system, which seems to be Neva's ex uh, favorite exoplanet system. It's um, a tiny system of seven, uh, at least seven exoplanets. Um, the sun is about the same size as Jupiter, and actually the system is overall on the same scale of Jupiter and its Galilean moons. But there are seven almost Earth-sized planets um, orbiting this very small, cool star. I just think it's a beautiful, weird system. I, and it's also after a beer. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm totally down with that system. Um, what are your guys' favorite galaxies besides the Milky Way? Oh, oh, geez. I don't know. Whirlpool. Whirlpool is pretty sweet. What's that one that's like a top? Wait, is it? The Sombrero Galaxy. Sombrero. Sombrero. Yeah, Sombrero is pretty cool. I like you, got, you guys picked two that have very different inclinations. Um, I actually have to agree with Cameron. My favorite is the Whirlpool Galaxy because it has dynamically in induced spiral arms. And it's a very interesting study of how spiral arm passages can increase turbulence in gas. But the spiral galaxy is really cool looking. And I've actually seen that with my naked eye. Oh, naked eye? All right, there's a telescope to me in it. OK, sure. yeah. let's not say naked eye when you don't mean naked eye. <laughs> All Fair right. enough. Well, uh, um, everyone, I, I've forgotten through, through this whole process to mention other live streams that you should definitely check out on YouTube that are similar to what we're doing here. So this is our first Astronomy on Tap, but there was an Astronomy on Tap on the couch event that took place a week ago that it was a seven hour long event that highlighted the contributions of all the Astronomy, well, not all of them, but many of the Astronomy on Tap chapters across the world and many of them in the in the United States. You can go view it if you go to the Astronomy on Tap YouTube channel. I'll include it. I haven't yet because I've been drinking, but I will include it in the description for this event in the next few minutes. And you can go there or you can just look up on Google Astronomy on Tap headquarters. Astronomy on Tap is the major chapter. Astronomy on Tap Texas, uh, AOT, ATX, based out of UT Austin is one of the most prolific of all the astronomy on taps that are out there. They have monthly events. They put monthly shows on and recorded them for years. Really, really good. Really, really high production value. I highly recommend those. So you should definitely check that out. Um, 
other events that are available on, on YouTube. Columbia Astronomy has a really good uh, astronomy outreach program with all kinds of really cool talks. They've had their last two events in the last two, ve two weeks online, which have been really, really good. So I encourage you to check out Columbia University Astronomy Outreach. Um, those are the major ones. Astronomy on Tap in Lansing at Michigan State has been really good. They put on a live event last week. It's on Facebook Live as opposed to YouTube Live, but that's a really cool resource. Anyway, there's there's cool events that were that people like us are trying to continue to put online during the pandemic, so you have something to keep you busy instead of just crying in your beer in solitary as as you are kept inside. We're crying our beers oh, together. He wants to add something, and Jessica Spake, what what do you want to add, guys? I just want to say, I Roger actually asked a great question. Yes. What the furthest galaxy observable is. Sorry, what is the furthest galaxy observable? Monday's a tough day. Uh, the um, highest, do you know the answer? I thought it was Redshift 8. Highest Redshift galaxy is between 7 and 10. All right, somewhere between less than a billion years into the age of the universe. Yeah, certainly, that's true. That's true. Um, so people have observed very, very early in the universe's history, some of the brightest, I guess at that time, galaxies in terms of star formation, and also kind of luckiest arrangements because, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the only galaxies we've seen at those redshifts have been uh, gravitationally lensed galaxies. Is that true? Am I a liar? Uh... I think the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, I'm sorry, the Hubble Extreme Deep Field that was released in 2012 had some non-lensed galaxies that are as far back as redshift of seven. But I think they're the being in the, what's that? They use the photometric dropout uh, scheme to get them? I think so, but I think, well, initially and then confirmed with spectroscopy. Okay. I think, I think, and then I think since then there have been a couple of additional ones that have been done by lensing. I think so. That but very, there. very early in the universe's history. In the like first in the first, years. in the first four or five hundred million years of the evolution of the universe. Uh, you're being even more, more it's careful. True, you're, no, you're I think it's true. Than me. I think it's true. Because I know the uh, H1 um, epoch of reionization stuff is pushing for like 500 million years. I mean, you want me to look this stuff up? I'm, I'm... That's cheating. Well, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's what they're all doing. They're like looking at <laughs> Wikipedia. What was the earliest? Is it, are, these, are these jerks wrong? <gasps> no, they're not. I mean, <laughs> hey, I always thought my thesis was crap, but okay. Everyone outside. All right. Any other any other things to add, peeps? Um. Oh, I've just enjoyed this so much. I'm really. I'm so pleased. Um. We've had people, you know, getting involved on the chat and watching. We still have like quite a few viewers. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining in. This has been so fun for me. Yeah, Thank this is for. super fun. Thanks to everybody. Oh yeah, uh, our next event, so we will have a Caltech Astronomy public lecture that's taking place in two and a half weeks on May, I don't know, May 8th, whatever the Friday of that first week in May is, that's given by a PhD phenomena graduate student, Mia de los Reyes about the loneliest galaxies in the universe. It should be super good. And then our next astronomy on tap, I don't remember the, the specific date. It's roughly a month away. We'll advertise through all of our normal means. I'll try and get the announcement out more than a few days in advance and it should be fun. So if you have feedback about this, mention it in the comments, unless you, it's just hate mail. I don't wanna read that. But if there's something in which we, we can improve these events, I'm happy to do so. And otherwise, Good luck with the quarantine. I know it sucks. We're doing the right thing by staying indoors and not spreading to our more feeble neighbors. So keep hey, up the good work. 
I don't even want a one in a hundred chance of dying. Oh, yeah. can I, um, a couple of people have asked what the ingredients are for my quarantini. Can I just say before we go? Yeah, lay it on. It's all, I, all I have left is this horrible, horrible bottle of vodka that my friend left at my house. Some limes, ice, and sugar. And those are the, like, I just mashed those up <laughs> into a drink. Isn't that it's, a gimlet? I was assuming it was going to be gin. I wish I had gin. Ah. As a member of the Commonwealth, I would have assumed gin. I know. I miss gin. gin. Tell you. Wretched. My dad always said, gin lost the British their empire, and rum is only for pirates. <laughs> what about vodka? No, that's okay. not good. And, and with that... Thanks so much. Cameron, thank thank you. you guys. Uh, thanks our, to our audience, and we'll uh, we'll include more in the in the description about links to the various things that we described. Thank you guys for coming, and have a good time in quarantine. We'll see if you guys you again soon. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Godspeed, doctors. <laughs>